would like to uh, introduce our next keynote to you. Uh, she is warm, wonderful, and brilliant, and is the research director for Institute for the Future's Future 50, where she's looking at how futures will reshape the decade. I'm really grateful that she's here with us. Uh, we met six years ago uh, when she was at Rock Health, and uh, please join me in welcoming Vanessa Mason. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, really glad to be here. Uh, so, yes, as you can see, we're engaging in some light subject matter right now, you know. Let's talk about power in the future. I'm sure that many of you saw the title of this talk and thought that it would be a 20-minute soliloquy about the superiority of Star Trek versus Star Wars. And yes, the answer is Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the future that I'm going to talk about today. I know pop culture tells us a lot about what the future is and what it will be, but I'd really like for you to use this concept of the future to really keep top of mind that future thinking is not a luxury, it's not just about culture, uh, but it's really, it's a necessity, especially as we look at the world today and how it's changing even more rapidly than maybe we could think about uh, previously. And that future thinking can be and is something that's very practical, a tool that anyone can pick up and use as a tool for getting things done today. So, one of the first principles of futures thinking is actually looking into the past. So I'd like to share a brief story about my past with you to give you a sense for uh, what I'm thinking about right now as I think about power in the future of health. So many moons ago, I was living in Argentina. I was working in an HIV clinic there. And a patient, let's call her Rosa, came into the clinic. Um, and the doctor sat down with her. He had um, run some labs, and so he was sitting down with her to talk about her labs. And it wasn't good news. Um, Rosa, outside of living with HIV, also was uh, living with hepatitis C. And the labs basically showed that she needed a liver transplant. And for any of you who've either received really heavy health news or known someone in your family or friends who have received heavy health news, you know that this is a really emotional moment, it's really hard, and so both of us were just sitting there really prepared to be there for her as she processed getting this prognosis. And do you know the first thing that she said to us was, I'm actually really upset. I'm really upset that I went to the market, I needed to buy milk for my kids, and it was two pesos. Last week it was 80 centavos. I can't afford to buy milk for my kids, I'm a terrible mother, what am I going to do? How do I deal with that, getting milk for my kids? And any conversation that we thought we were going to have about the struggles of navigating organ transplantation, the struggles that she was going to face and with being someone who lived with HIV and hepatitis C trying to get a liver transplant, were a non-starter. And so I tell this story because in talking about power, all of us bring biases and misconceptions to the work that we do now in the present as to how we think about the future. And it really influences who has power and what we think they can do with it and what they can actually do with power. So, you know, you might have started to hear the story and thought that she was disempowered because of her health condition, but fundamentally, she would tell you that it was because of her finances. So how can we use that story and think about the, like, the future of health now. So, I know this is a minor topic, but I'm going to do my best to really both challenge your thinking about this, of course, lofty topic, and really help you see how it's relevant for your work in healthcare design. Uh, and so the first thing I want to say is, of course, power isn't static. The people who hold power and wield it are changing at a dizzying pace, and it might be really difficult to keep track of where and when and how, but I want to offer both a definition as well as three examples with how power is changing now and what that could mean for the future. So this is the definition of power that I'm working with. It's about the ability to drive consequences um, and taking inspiration from Spider-Man with extreme power comes extreme consequences. And so when we look at power both in our past and our present through with the, uh, the lives of people like Rosa, what does that mean for our future? So 
this photograph is um, actually on the window of um, my organization's office in Palo Alto. And I love this quote because it's a really great mindset setting when you start talking with people about futures. Um, to get them past that, like, we need to do what's expected. We have constraints and we can't possibly get past that. There's just too many barriers. Like, we have to, we have to, we have to. Um, and so I would encourage you to be ridiculous. Think ridiculous things. Um, and I'm going to highlight three signals, or you can think of these as sort of thought-provoking kind of innovations or emerging um, things um, that have the potential to scale and impact the future of health. They might seem ridiculous at first glance, maybe because your gut instinct is to say, that's not right, or maybe to say that that really doesn't really fit with what I think of as power or what I think of as something that affects health. But I really want you, again, to challenge what you're thinking about and how you might act upon this information. So let's start off with women. Um, for those of you who haven't been working around startups, may not be familiar with, there is a major boom in femtech going on. And true to form with technology, we have to put new names on everything. Femtech is simply the application of technology or digital health to women's health issues. Uh, just to paint a picture of what femtech looks like and what it means. Um, about 60% of femtech startups are focused on fertility, nursing, and pregnancy. Collectively, these startups have raised over a billion dollars in investment, so definitely not a small matter that we're talking about. So for me, as someone who entered in digital health um, six years ago in this field, and also as someone who's worked in a position, as Amy mentioned before, at Rock Health, focused on women in positions of digital health leadership, I'm obviously really heartened by this news. We finally, in the digital health industry, and also I think by extension in medicine, are really taking seriously the needs of women and really trying to work to serve the needs of women's health. That's incredibly positive news that women have more knowledge and access and understanding of fertility that they've ever had before. We now are starting to see the beginnings of a shift of fertility kind of starting out of the margins and moving to just part of the normal conversation and navigation as being an, an informed female health consumer. But we've done this at a cost. We've basically expanded surveillance of women. We've introduced new privacy questions as they track their periods, as we um, introduce fertility questions earlier in the paradigm and kind of expand that pie around the market. Um, and, and in a certain sense, we're kind of profiting off of a lot of anxiety and fear around either trying to get pregnant or trying not to get pregnant. And on top of that, we have this very defined paradigm of pregnancy in this country that doesn't really include populations like lesbians and trans women. So the question that I want to leave you with is, what does designing for well-being and health look like for women, all women, and specifically, what does that well-being look like when it doesn't include pregnancy? On to the kids. They're not all right. And I say this somewhat jokingly. Um, to be fair, I'm going to call myself out. I am a millennial. Um, and so there's a lot of research uh, coming out now that um, basically millennials have about double the risk of some cancers compared to baby movers in the same age. So things like colon cancer, um, a lot of basically obesity-related cancers, the incidence is rising in young adults in the United States. We don't exactly know why, but there's a really early correlation. But what does this tell us about power? I mean, this is an epidemiological finding. Well, I think one thing that we can take in, in heart is that millennials care a lot about their health. They really want to take a lot of control over their health. But I think in terms of what does it mean, we still have an association that being young is basically a guarantee for health. We still think of young people as, well, as long as you don't get hit by a bus, you're OK. And kind of what this finding shows us is that, no, we really need to be thinking that uh, life extension sort of like helping us live longer is not simply about age. It's not, um, it's more about what sort of decisions are people making. And I think more importantly, when we talk about millennials, is that these are people my age. They have a lot of, I have friends that have young children. A lot of them are also caring for aging parents. And some of them are doing both at the same time. And while yes, Gen X has been uh, suffering with that silently, I don't want to acknowledge Gen X because a lot of time they don't get acknowledged at all. Um, 
Partly why there's a sort of newfound urgency when we think about this is that millennials are the largest generation after baby boomers. So if they're already facing problems now in their 30s, what is it going to be like 20 years from now? And what are we prepared for and what are we not prepared for in terms of how they can engage, what they care about, what is their version of needing to pay for milk for their kids when they receive a prognosis of a liver transplant? So the question that I want to leave you with is, what would an AARP for millennials look like? Who would join? Why would they join? What does it mean for the health of their kids? What does it mean for the health of their parents? And what does it mean for how we look at um, age and health, both now and in the future? And lastly, mental health. Yes, death, became, death becomes us, but now it's more about disability when you really think about it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the World Health Organization now recognizes gaming disorder, basically video uh, game addiction, uh, um, colloquial you can call it, definitely a controversial uh, classification, but one you could definitely see is necessary. So this screenshot is uh, from a, a doc documentary called I Was a Winner, um, produced by Jonas Odell, a Swedish filmmaker, uh, with um, it's a complete animation using gaming avatars, but the audio is from interviews with people who are gaming addicts. And it's kind of one of like a, an early sort of artistic creation that really starts to illustrate the lives of people living with gaming addiction, um, which we haven't really heard the voices of that much. Um, so one, I add this here because I think, of course, when we think of addiction, of like the opioid crisis, and indubitably thinking of illicit drugs, other substance use, and so, this is both familiar within an addiction paradigm, but also kind of new because it's about technology. Um, but I think largely, like, yes, having artistic pieces like this documentary, being able to open a conversation about mental health, about behavioral health is incredibly important. Um, and being able to look at that as a means of shifting the burden and alleviating that from patients kind of suffering in silence, either feeling shame or trying to avoid uh, that stigma, and trying to focus more attention on where do we need to increase access to treatment or enable other treatments is certainly welcome. But interestingly, when you specifically look at this documentary, what the filmmaker noticed when he looked at a lot of the responses from the folks that he was interviewing was, uh, a lot of them seemed to be about chasing affirmation. Like they were using video games to find things in those games that they could not find in the real world. A lot about validation, a lot about belonging, a lot about feeling like competent in a world that seemed to reject any sort of interest or skills that they had. And so, you know, I think there's still those commonalities of mental health being like this silent struggle, but I really want us to kind of adopt that frame of thinking about if people are really pursuing identity, if they're pursuing things like dignity um, and being seen and being included, what does addiction look like in a world where maybe we could have people feel included? Where people didn't feel like if they go to their doctor and say, hey, I've been playing games for 16 hours straight, that that's actually something that they can bring up in a doctor's office because let's face it, we expect for other people living with addiction to do the same. But they don't do that either, so why would we expect that of gaming addiction as well? So how can we kind of use the interconnectedness that we already have with social networks and with virtual spaces and virtual reality, uh, with all of these live gaming to really have spaces where we can reaffirm dignity, reaffirm including um, in, in ways where people can actually feel that um, they can be healthy and seen. So, you know, talking about a few things like the femtech boom and millennial cancer and gaming addiction definitely sounds dark and scary. Um, it tells us how like sort of struggles over power over what's influencing health and what people have the ability to uh, use power to affect health. Um, it tells us something about the future, but it doesn't tell us everything. Um, and so a lot of the conceptions of power when we think about our powers as zero sum game, it's about sort of fighting for resources and influences among scarcity. Um, but when I take a step back and think about these things, the three, so the, the three sort of signals or provocations, the thread holding them all together, is that they're all consequences of invisible systems of inequity. With women's health, it's sexism, the sort of 
the, the bigotry of, of like, we're helping you so much by giving you more information and simultaneously more responsibility. Ageism and that, yes, we have um, seniors who are excluded and certainly need a lot of assistance, but we also have a large young population that we've forgotten about altogether. And ableism, when we really think about mental health and addiction and what that experience is like for people going through that and how can we really reach them in ways that they want to be reached. So I think that we can really look at these sort of emerging inequities as provocations. We can redefine power and how it affects the future of health as invisible actions that have visible impact. So what does this mean for maybe what you can do as designers and what you can think about going forward as you think about the impact of power on health? First, you can ask what you aren't seeing. You know, much of the insidious nature of power and health lives in the dark. It's behind closed doors. It's behind the veil. It's behind shame. It's behind stigma. It's behind complexity, whether it's about acronyms, whether it's about language, whether it's about arcane bureaucratic processes that make doing anything virtually impossible. And so when you think about this extending towards the future and about technology and you think about uh, bias in artificial intelligence, that we don't know where data comes from, that we don't know how data is an analyzed, and we don't have a feedback loop to be able to know whether the conclusions that we're seeing are, in fact, correct. That's why looking at making power visible in your work as designers is really crucial to looking at how power can actually affect a better future of health. And secondly, Make it emotional. There's a famous Maya Angelou quote about people will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that amid all the technology and innovation that we're talking about design, it's really easy to get caught up and flooded with algorithms and say, we're just going to automate so many things. We're going to be able to detect so much data. We've got so much data here, and it's just about interoperability. And you're kind of missing the sort of human, empathetic, connection, belonging, identity aspect of what does it mean to be human, what we all crave as people, whether or not we are identified as a patient, whether we are identified as a provider, and outside of that context of let's just fix the algorithms and not look at the entire context. So I would posit that when you look at these systems of inequity, really the, the language that really matters are stories. So thinking about what are the stories and experiences that, that you can design and that you can shape, like how can you make experiences kind of interrupt the, the binary rational part of algorithms and actually tell what does this actually mean? Like what is this lived experience of um, human understanding that facilitates people being healthy? How could you shift the language of your company or your organization to communicate in stories? And really, how can you use your power to design a better future of health?